Hello, and welcome to the Dow of Sports video cast. I'm Troy Kirby, along with Steve DeLay. Now, this is an exciting moment for us because of the fact that realistically, Steve, the Ultimate Toolkit is something that we have not seen before. We've seen different incarnations from John Spolstra, but this one is a little bit special. Kind of talk about that. This is the uh, first time anybody has seen the actual Ultimate Toolkit uh, all together in one uh, big bundle. Uh, it started with an idea that John and I had of rewriting the original How to Sell the Last Seat in the House and evolved into what you see here, nine different workbooks, uh, a website for downloading videos and ads and all the things anybody would ever need for ticket sales, kind of a how, how to A to Z. Do people not understand how to do ticket sales? What, what is this going to help us do? Uh, I think everybody has their own strategy and philosophy and style and manner in which they do it. Uh, everybody knows John Spolster has been doing this for 30 plus years. I've worked with John for probably 20 of those 30 years, first in New Jersey Nets, then at uh, Mandalay. We did a lot of great stuff that we thought it might be a good idea to show and share everything we did between ticket packaging, strategy and tactics, sales training materials, uh, how to put on a boot camp, how to do group sales, uh, how to uh, give salespeople all the tools they need to be successful, as well as teams or colleges or uh, even international teams, how to do this stuff. So let's go over the history of the how to sell the last seat of the house, because that was John Spolstra's version, but it had stayed out there for so long that realistically it needed a little bit of a refresher course. That's where you come in, and now this has been built into something even wider. Yeah, it was actually funny. John wrote it, the original one, 1991, I think, uh, and it had been 20-some years, and people were always looking for it uh, and always wanted to buy it. In fact, he actually set up his own website because he still could sell it. Uh, he would sell one or two a month, and it was probably June of 2012. John and I were playing golf and I said, John, I keep getting people asking me and hiring me as a consultant to do this stuff. We should rewrite the original How to Set a Last Seat in the House. And he quite frankly said, I'm retired. I don't want to do that. I'm not interested. I said, well, I'll rewrite it, but I need your help. Uh, we both shared a lot of the great things we did at Mandalay and at the Nets. So I'll write it. You edit it. Uh, and as we got into it, it became a bigger, bigger uh, project that we were working on. Originally, John wrote the first one as a basically a textbook for a college class he was teaching, which was a global overview. And then what we decided to do is say, hey, instead of a global overview, let's give everybody the how-to, the step-by-step -step on how to price tickets, uh, why discounting is a bad idea, how to set up a sales staff, uh, everything they'd ever need to know. As we did that, quite frankly, it evolved into, we said, well, geez, if we're going to teach somebody how to set up a sales staff, we then need to teach them how to train the sales staff. And then we need to teach the salespeople how to be successful. And as we kept doing it, that evolved into group sales training. It evolved into a handbook for group salespeople to study and learn from. And it c continued to go all the way to the point where you even have a, a president's ticket sales bible of the things a president should be looking for, an athletic director should be looking for, for uh, a team or first school to make sure they're successful selling tickets. So why now kind of comes into why are ticket sales so hard to kind of master? Because we have different versions of stra strategy and everything else. Does it come to really the nuance of knowing what each role is, I guess, within the department if they're going to sell tickets right? Well, I think it kind of, it goes back to the fundamentals. Everybody gets dazzled by things like dynamic pricing or variable pricing or social media. And gee, I call it the butterfly in the outfield. When you're a little kid and you're somebody on, on your little league baseball team, always chase the butterfly instead of the baseball. It's kind of the same way. And we, had, we wanted to give people the tools to get back to the basic fundamentals. Create ticket products that your fans want to buy develop strategies that help take those ticket products to the market and to the right market, hire and train salespeople to execute that strategy, and then keep track of everything you're doing to make sure it works and evolve your marketing strategy. So many teams these days just shoot from the hip. They think short term. They think about next week's gate receipts, next week's drop count, as opposed to a long-term sustainable ticket sales strategy. So this goes into a different strategy aspect with each individual book. Kind of talk about each individual book. I know it's a little bit dense. You've been writing it for over a year now. Uh, when you go to the ticket manager's uh, components of this, what is the ticket manager really supposed to do with this book? Are they supposed to just read it and go, OK? Or, I mean, are they really supposed to, is, does it work, does the workbook go further? Like, this is the ticket sales manager's Bible. It's about, I think, 60 pages of 
day-to-day, step-by-step. Uh, and I had a lot of people, when I first started talking to some people in the industry that were doing this, I said, geez, the strategy and tactics is great. But also, the sales manager usually is the best salesperson. They get promoted to becoming the sales manager, and nobody ever says, hey, here's how you manage the staff. Here's how you, what you should do on a day-to-day basis. So we walk them through everything from uh, weekly meetings with your salespeople, reviewing pending lists, uh, how to write a job description uh, to hire salespeople, where to post the job, what interview questions to ask, what criteria they should look for, and what would be a successful salesperson. We also walk them through all the training aspects of how to train salespeople on a step-by-step basis, and then what to do for six months afterwards. Once you've gone through the initial training, what do you do next? I talk to so many teams that when you say, hey, what's your training for a brand new salesperson? They say, well, we, we give them the script and we give them product information, and we spend a couple hours with them, then we have them go sit next to a senior salesperson and listen to what they say. And the next day, they're on, the, they're on their own. We always put our guys at Mandalay and at the Nets through a four-day boot camp. Uh, and then it was six months of ongoing videotaping, role play, practice, step by step. That's the key things that a sales manager has to know. Are we fitting way too much into a telemarketer's kind of culture and not one of this type of nuance where it's more about embracing training and a culture? Yeah, I think it's a combination of both. And, and one of the things we talk about is, is, and like I said, is you have ticket products that fit your target markets, then you have a strategy to take those products to your particular market. So if you're trying to sell somebody $150, $200 club seats, that's not Joe Fan that you're going to pick up and call and say, hey, you want to spend $25,000 on club seats. That is a how to go get an appointment with the CEO of a company, see them face to face, and walk them through why they should spend $25,000 to buy club seats. So that's one facet, which is kind of the outside sales, corporate sales part of this. Then for group sales, it's a whole different strategy. It's a whole different approach and a whole different target market. You gotta have different products and you gotta teach group salespeople who to call on, how to find the right group leader. If they're calling on a church, there might be five or six different group leaders. How to get that right group leader, how to gather the information of uh, information you need uh, to know to help make a recommendation, how to help them market the group, how to get them excited, closing the sale, communication, step by step by step, even with our group sales staff. It's a three-day boot camp to get them to the point where they need to know. Quite frankly, we don't spend a lot of time on telemarketing because in my mind, the telemarketer is targeted toward Joe Fan, the guy who's already a fan of the team, already interested in going to the games, and you can get to them with email and with direct mail. And then your inside sales staff, that's just kind of a follow-up. To me, it's, instead of beating somebody over the head with uh, you know, phone call after phone call after phone call, I'd rather have them send, and we talk a little bit about triple threat marketing, send a letter. The day the letter lands in their mailbox, they also get an email from you, and then the very next day they get a call from one of your salespeople. And that sales call then is, hey, I'm just following up with the letter and the email you received. It's not the salesperson trying to beat them over the head trying to get them to buy something they shouldn't. Do we not take as an industry ticket sales as an art? I mean, because I think sometimes we'll talk about marketing and other promotions, but realistically, even though it's the highest ROI we can get, ticket sales seems to be kind of shoved in the corner as far as importance. It's almost one of those things where, and you see it with kids coming out of college, yeah, if I have to get into the business and sell tickets, I'll do that, then I'll go into marketing. Uh, And my belief always been, and you're starting to see it with teams now, they're hiring chief revenue officers and they realize revenue is what matters. And marketing many times falls under revenue because marketing's great. Everybody wants to run the big billboard advertising, the TV spots and the radio spots. That's cool. But I don't sell any tickets. It doesn't matter. Whether you're a pro sports team or a college, everything revolves around ticket sales and teams and colleges need to spend a lot more time on ticket sales because without people buying tickets, nobody's buying a sponsorship. Without anybody buying a sponsorship, the media uh, TV deals aren't nearly as big. If you're in college, the recruits aren't interested in playing in front of a building and in front of a crowd that's half filled or a third filled. The donors aren't going to donate if nobody's coming to the games. Everything centers on ticket sales. Getting the appointment is something that I don't think enough people talk about. You even have a book to it, which is a a great little monument to how big getting an appointment is. Kind of tell me why getting an appointment is so much better, especially when you're selling to businesses, than trying to sell them over the phone. Well, this is great. This is the book. It's the Getting the Appointment Handbook, and it's basically a 50-page step-by-step for a salesperson on how to do it. And we also provide telechart cards for people to download and have the objections handled. So if you pick up the phone and call the CEO of a company, first of all, you gotta know when to call them. 
you're not going to call the CEO of a company at 10 o'clock in the morning because they're in a meeting, they're on a, doing their own sales calls. So we teach our staff, call them at 7.30, 8 o'clock in the morning, get them before the secretaries and gatekeepers and assistants get in, and then you got to know what to say. you got to be able to say, hi, I'm calling, I've got an idea that I think you would like, I want to come see you. They're going to throw objections at you, so you've got to handle those objections because, again, nobody's buying ten or twenty or $30,000 worth of product, any product, over the phone, which is what telemarketers love to be able to do. If I was selling tickets for the Miami Heat, yeah, I could probably sell tickets over the phone to the CEO. If I was selling tickets for the Dallas Cowboys, even there I could probably sell tickets over the phone because they're popular and people have to have them. But if you're a team that's half full, three quarters full, not sold out, you have to get your expensive seats sold, go see people face to face. So when we go through all these books, you, you have several under the Ultimate Toolkit, which are just in the red, which means that they're all about sales. You also have about actually doing the boot camp, which a lot of people talk about, but nobody actually sets up. How, how, do you, how do you set up a boot camp and how do you make sure that it actually works for the person that is really training for the first time? Yeah, this is the great one. This is the Ticket Sales Manager's Boot Camp Manual. And literally what this is, we'll start it with, here's how you pick the hotel where you should do your boot camp. Here's how you set up the training, the meeting room space. Here is your day-to-day -day agenda when you're uh, teaching how to get an appointment, when you're teaching what to say in the presentation, when you're doing role plays. Uh, and we even go through as much as pr providing the PowerPoint slides that you use in the boot camp and then telling the sales manager, here's what you should say while this PowerPoint's up on the screen. We want to make it as simple and easy as possible for that sales manager to train and to teach because it's so difficult for that person to go from, hey, I was the top salesperson to the manager and then turn around and try and explain it to everybody else why they're so good. We give them A to Z. This is the uh, sales manager's boot camp manual. It's 85 pages. Does that sound like a lot of reading? It is. But you can see the slides here, what to say, the teaching that goes with it. It's when John and I started this, John said, I want to leave a legacy uh, in this industry. I've been in it for a long time, and, and I'm, I'm retired now, and I want to do, tell everybody what I've done. This is kind of the legacy, whether it's outside sales on how to get an uh, appointment, how to get a sale, how to put on a boot camp. Every step of the way, it's all in here. But also with the getting the sale handbook, now that's important in itself because that's more about the psychology of it, whereas a lot of people will say, oh, yeah, you just, you just use a closer line, you do a few things. That's not really going to help a salesperson, especially long term, when you're trying to fit through whether you're having a rut or whether you're having a bunch of success. How do I repeat this? How do I not repeat this? How do you make sure that everything works out? That's kind of why you have those types of handbooks, correct? Yeah, well, it's funny because there's so many teams, especially in the pro ranks, where it's season tickets, season tickets, season tickets. And if you're calling on a company who has 15 employees and one salesperson, season tickets are a terrible idea because they're never going to use them all and they're not going to come back. They might buy it once because you did a great job with a closing tech and technique or something special. What the, the getting the sale handbook is, is how to talk to any company and present your product and present your different ticket packages in a way that they can understand, here's how this is going to impact my business. And if I'm successful at showing you how it's going to impact your business and then I follow through and make sure it does, you become a ticket package buyer or maybe a season ticket holder for a long, long time. And then you become ingrained and it becomes part of your business to use the team's tickets to help you succeed, whether it's employee reward, client entertainment, prospect entertainment, all of those steps. So then we're going to also talk about the fact that group sales are really fundamentally different from just regular ticket sales. They're kind of their own subculture at art, and you actually broke it down into three books, especially the group sales manager. That's an important one because a lot of people don't know what they're leading to. It's kind of the same model, whereas with a group sales manager is same deal. How do we train your salespeople, your group salespeople, to really be successful? And how do they go through the steps necessary to find new groups and build on uh, expanding group sales? And then the step-by-step -step after that, what to look for in activity reports, what to look for in the daily sales report, how often do you meet with your salesperson, and how often should they be going on sales calls? I did some consulting work with an NBA team uh, for a while, and their group sales staff was terrific, top five in the league. And then we started to look at how many prospects they'd actually hit in their market, and we discovered it was like 20% of the available prospects. And we started digging and teaching and training, and their group sales has gone up probably 50% in that uh, one-year span, just because all of a sudden the salespeople realized 
how much more was possible. And from that, there's a lot of the idea that, you know, group sales or regular ticket sales, well, you know, we, we'll separate them. That's really not that big of a deal to kind of, you know, mesh it all together. You talked about what the president gets, but also there's the strategy involved and the tactics. And those things generally aren't talked about in a global sense. We'll talk about group sales separately or we'll talk about ticket sales, but we never talk about how they marry each other and how we go forward. Kind of explain the, the big thick book, as, as I call it, you know, the, the, the Moby Dick of the... <laughs> this is the Bible. Yeah. This is the one that matters. The war and peace. Of, <laughs> but, I mean, realistically, it's something that goes beyond that into a global system of not only pricing, but also understanding the relationship between all of them together in tandem when you're actually selling a product. Well, you ask the question of, like, why do people struggle with ticket sales? And most of the time it's because they don't have a philosophy. They don't have a strategy. It's shoot from the hip. It's what are we doing next week? What are we doing next month? And they haven't stopped to really think about how they're going to get to the point from where they are today to three years later being sold out. And one of the things we built into this strategy and tactics uh, and everything in this is, hey, if you follow this, you can be sold out every game, every ticket in three years. And the strategy and tactics part is explaining things like full menu marketing. Why full menu marketing is important from day one and not just what so many teams do where it's like, hey, three or four weeks before the season starts, we'll roll out some mini plans and we'll hopefully get a few people to buy those. But we got to sell season tickets up until then. To me, that's a waste of time because your salespeople making all these sales calls for the first four or five months. If they don't have all the products to sell in full menu marketing, they've left 90% of their sales on the table. We'll go through how to price and strategically price, not just say, hey, we're going to increase everything 3%. Uh, but it's section by section, how to look at your beachfront property, how do you look at your property that's on the other side of the road from the beach, maximizing pricing while at the same time maximizing gate receipts. If you maximize your gate receipts and get sellouts, that's what this part is all about, the strategy and tactics. We'll go through how group sales uh, contributes to the sellout strategy to maximize your uh, continued sellouts, how to go value added on group sales instead of discounting, why discounting as a whole is a terrible idea for teams to do and why it burns them. Uh, or free tickets. Or comp tickets, yeah. <laughs> I've, I've been involved with teams that free tickets were the strategy to get people to come to the game. It just doesn't work. Free tickets is not a lure. Yeah, even all the way to the point of, of advertising strategy. We'd all love to have Nike and Budweiser's budget, but we don't. No team does. So how do you use advertising that actually generates an ROI? How do you make sure that any nickel you spend gets you four to one, five to one, six to one back? And that's every step is in here. And then on the website we added was sample ads, sample renewal letters, sample direct mail pieces, uh, sample renewal pieces for people to use. Uh, and people can take what they want, where they need help, and where they don't need help and use as much of it as makes sense for them. So when you're looking at building all of this stuff, you are giving away the king secrets. You never know whether or not that's a, a good thing or a bad thing. You may, you may have uh, some people that are really upset with you and some people that are really grateful. Now it comes into a giant box, and it comes into this you know, giant kind of top secret box that everyone gets for the ultimate toolkit. Uh, order, you, people can order the stuff right now, correct? Uh, we are ordering it. It's going online January 2nd. So as soon as uh, this podcast is broadcast, they'll be able to order it. They'll be able to go to the Ultimate Toolkit website uh, and buy it. Uh, they can call me uh, or email me at any time. I'm happy to help provide answers, give insight as to what's in it, why it's in it. But we wanted to make it cool. We didn't want to just send people a whole bunch of things to read. And it's kind of like when you were in college and all of a sudden you went to the bookstore and picked up all your books and you went, oh my gosh, I've got like nine books i got to read. We wanted to deliver in a way where it was neat for people to have something they could sit on their desk and say, this is my philosophy, this is my strategy, and these are the tools I'm going to need to get sold out. Uh, and that's where the ultimate toolkit came in because it really is all the tools necessary step by step to go from point A to point Z. And with the Spolster name as well as your own, you don't put yourself behind bad products. He doesn't put himself behind bad Oh, issues, <laughs> no. But at the same time, that that's also lends the credibility to what you're saying because you have been a result of how many sellouts? Almost three thousand, four thousand. Yeah, I think between the two of us, we added it up, and there's a little overlap because we were involved in the Dayton Dragons together for quite a while. But it was over twenty seven hundred sellouts. Uh, John is unique because the Dayton Dragons, which was a Mandalay team, uh, as of the end of two thousand thirteen, they had nine hundred eighty three straight sellouts the most ever in professional sports. 
the number two team is the Portland Trailblazers, which is 814. And John was part of that sellout streak also from 1979. He left in 1990, so he sold out most of those games while he was there. So, and, and luckily with us, with, when we were both with Mandalay, we had nine different teams and had a tremendous amount of success selling a ton of tickets for in all kinds of different markets, all kinds of different situations, whether it was the Dayton Dragons, who were the only team in town and sold out every game, or the Staten Island Yankees, uh, who hadn't sold a game out in seven years when we bought the team. We took it from no sellouts to 28 sellouts out of 38 games within three years. Everything's a little bit different, and our experience and the consulting work John's done that I've done is probably... 30 different markets that we've seen. So essentially by buying this book, you don't need specifically a consultant every single time. You can actually set up your own in-house ticket model, which actually does outside sales, correct? I'm going to put myself out of business as a consultant, which I'm okay with. Uh, If somebody buys this, they should never have to hire another ticket sales trainer. They should never have to hire a ticket sales consultant because everything they need is right here. We've given a sales manager all the tools to train for groups, train for getting an appointment, train for making the sale, all the samples they'd ever need for print advertising, newspaper, uh, radio, uh, renewal letters, uh, direct mail pieces, all that stuff is all right there. And quite frankly, it's it's cheaper than hiring a sales trainer to come in for a couple of days. So we're going to see you get death threats from sales trainers. <laughs> Entirely possible. I've, I've been on some panels with a few sales trainers who have kind of looked at me quizzically about what I was doing, why we were doing this. But, you know, and everybody's got a different strategy and a different approach. Uh, we like to think this one's been really successful, both for John and for me. Uh, and if we can do this where people don't need to hire a sales trainer or a sales consultant, that's great. Absolutely, positively. But one of the problems that sales trainers typically have is they're viewed as a quick fix, as short-term gain, and once somebody does that in their budget and they have the sales trainer, they don't really follow up and they don't really apply the stuff. That that's also needs to be said about these books. You actually have to read them and you actually have to get something yeah. out of them, correct? I, and I've been in the same situation. It bugs me to no end where you hire a sales trainer, they come in for a couple of days, get everybody riled up and excited, and this is awesome. Two weeks later, everything that sales trainer taught them is completely gone. The neat thing about this stuff is not only do we give you the step-by-step for the training, but we also give you the step-by-step for the follow-up. And there's things in here like the Getting the Sale Handbook. This goes to the salesperson. This is their study guide. This is what they read and study every night for three or four months, so it's ingrained and it becomes part of their DNA, as opposed to some PowerPoint slides that a sales trainer would put up and get everybody excited. And then the videotape role plays and the step-by-step. We've done things, and I, I... I love to show them where a salesperson from day one, the first day they've gone through this, to where they are six months later, they're entirely different people. And there's been a lot of people who've gone through this type of training and this type of strategy and tactics who've gone on to great stuff within the sports industry, guys in the NFL, guys in the NBA, guys in various college places. So we know it works, and we know people have been successful with it. And you have had early adopters, and not just teams. You've had some just regular you know, ticket sales reps who are willing to invest in this. I mean, this isn't just, you know, one big team makes the big splash. It's everybody, right? I tell you, I got a call from a, minor, a general manager for a minor league baseball team. And I, this surprised me. I, I give this person credit. He said, I'm going to try and get my ownership to pay for this. If they don't, I'm going to pay for it out of my own pocket. I said, wow, that's, that's bold. Why? He said, well, two reasons. Number one, I get paid a percentage of increased revenue. So I know this will be so successful, the revenue will go up dramatically, I'll pay for it back. He said, number two, if I buy it, it's mine. And if I go on to another team or somewhere else at a college or something else, I get to take it with me. So I will have this for the rest of my career to study, follow, and make sure it works. That's pretty bold. I mean, that's a guy that's got a big upside to him if he's thinking that way. Uh, But there's been colleges, there's been pro teams, there's been minor league teams, minor league hockey, minor league baseball. Internationally, there's people who have looked at it. Uh, so I think it'll be something that there's a lot of different people will be excited about. You know, I get asked about ticket sales a lot, especially internationally, and everyone goes, how do I, how do, I do this? How do we make sure our stuff grows? With this type of stuff, you can actually convert this over to what somebody's doing in a rugby league. Does it, it's not necessarily just American sports, correct? Exactly. Like the strategy and tactics especially are applicable for any team. Uh, I, for years, back when I was with the Nets, we used to have a person from the Spanish Basketball League come over and spend a month or two in our office. And for some reason, I always ended up housing them. But they came over, and this is back in the early 90s, to learn 
sports marketing strategy uh, from the net. So now there's teams, English Premier League, Australian football, rugby, everywhere that need to sell tickets. All this stuff is applicable uh, and trainable and transferable to any country in any uh, industry. And one of the things I've always heard from, you know, internationally as well, Americans don't understand the membership model. This actually understands the membership model and kind of works it in to where whether or not it's season tickets, whether or not it's mini packs, it's, it's all universal, right? Yeah, absolutely. I, in fact, actually, this works even better with the membership model because I think the membership model is something that uh, American teams are actually starting to absorb and evolve to to make it a bigger deal. But it still comes down to the fundamentals. The biggest reason somebody is involved is because they want to go to the games and they like going to the games and the games are beneficial for them. So even if you're a company in Australia, for rugby or cricket, all these tools and things still work for those teams to be able to communicate to those companies or, you know, you sports team uh, that follows those uh, teams also in those leagues. So when we're looking at this, you're also on the website that you guys are creating and setting up. There's going to be a lot more stuff. It's not just the ultimate toolkit. There might be a few videos. There might be a few accessible things, correct? Yeah. Anybody who gets involved with this, first of all, on just on the main website, there'll be blog posts. John will do blog posts. I'll do blog posts, uh, things we've seen interesting in, in the world of ticket sales. Uh, and any of the people who purchase the toolkit, they'll get access to everything. They'll get access to all the PowerPoints, uh, telechart cards, Sample videos. Uh, we have sample videos of the perfect sales pitch, the perfect appointment uh, pitch, the perfect group sales pitch. So, and there'll also be videos up there of me doing boot camps. So, anybody who's a little bit nervous about doing their own boot camp, they can literally watch a video of me doing sections of the boot camp, saying, "Oh, okay, now I understand what I'm supposed to say. I get it. I can go do that now." Uh, and then they can show videos of the perfect sales pitch to their salespeople. Say, "This is what this is supposed to sound like and look like." Now, let's go through it. Let's get somebody else to. Uh, on our staff to manage it. Which I think is a good point to make is you're not letting them go after they've bought the toolkit and going, you know, fairly well. There's actually some follow-up. There's actually some development if they want to continue to grow in this. So it's always evolving. Yeah, and, and you're right. It's not, hey, good luck, knock yourself out, uh, go for it. It's call me anytime, uh, shoot me an email. John's available via email. If he's not on the golf course, uh, uh, he'll respond very quickly. We want people to succeed. We don't want them to just get it and read it and go, oh, geez, I'm not quite sure about this, this, and this. I'm just not going to do it. And I'm going to put that aside and it's going to collect dust. What we'd rather do is have people read it and go, oh, wow, that's an interesting thought or question. Let me call Steve or let me call John or let me shoot him an email and get more information uh, and dig deeper so we can help them. I'd love to see people in five or ten years still utilizing this type of thing. Uh, just like the original How to Sell Last Seat in the House, 20 years later, people are still buying it. And as soon as the word got out that this was being created, there were a lot of people saying, I got to get the update. I got to get the newest one. It's about time. Oh, yeah. I heard a lot of people <laughs> on the podcast that I did with John where it, it became, well, how do I get it? And that's you know, kind of where you know, this video came from. Is I, sure. I think there's a lot of interest out there. So thank you very much, Steve, for being on the podcast. I Absolutely. Appreciate I appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs>